Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program on the um, ambitious topic, the future of nursing, paren, and medicine, and patient care, and paren. We might be here for a while. <laughs> Um, but no, in this hour we will be talking about a very important subject, um, and, and that is the future of healthcare. Um, I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, which produces this weekly Medical Center Hour for you. We're delighted that today's program is done jointly with the School of Nursing and celebrates um, the late Dean uh, Zula Mae Baber Weiss. Uh, this is the uh, Zula Mae Baber Weiss Memorial Lecture of the School of Nursing. Um, this business of the future of healthcare. Um, in 2008, two of the country's leading organizations on healthcare, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Institute of Medicine, partnered on a two-year initiative on the future of nursing. Now our speaker for today tells me there have also been some other groups, nationally and internationally, also who've picked up this challenge of thinking actively um, about the future of the profession. And there are similar um, task forces, committees, etc., um, rethinking or thinking anew about medicine uh, and medical education for the future as well. So we're in a, an interesting time of change. <coughs> In this particular collaborative of the IOM and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, there was a, an 18-month study that yielded a blueprint for action on ways that nursing might transform itself. There was a follow-up national conference in 2010, um, and since then, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has joined with the Center to Champion Nursing in America to move the report's recommendations forward. And there are now initiatives underway in most states that actually touch not only nursing, but the other health professions as well. Um, now the report from this group insists that all health professionals must work together to provide high quality patient-centered health care to everyone in the United States. But truly collaborative practice requires nothing less than remodeling traditional practice for all of the health professions and rethinking key elements of the healthcare system, including health professional education, practice regulation, and of course, payment and financial models. So in this Medical Center Hour, we, have, uh, we feature University of Pennsylvania Professor Julie Fairman, um, who's a distinguished scholar in this area. Um, she will be talking to us and the um, the joy of introducing her belongs to Dory Fontaine, the Dean of the Nursing School. Uh, Dory is the Sadie Heath uh, Cabinet <coughs> Professor and the Dean of the School of Nursing. And she will introduce us to our guest and uh, we'll have a talk. And then we'll have time for some of your questions and discussion. Welcome, Dory. Thank you, Marcia. Dr. Childress. So I'm very pleased to welcome everyone here. Um, that looks like my alums, my students, <coughs> across all programs, friends of the school, um, individuals that are chief nurses that came from across town. So I just welcome everyone to the 34th, this is the 34th, <coughs> annual Zula Mae Baber Weiss Memorial Lecture. And I want to thank our collaboration with the Medical Center Hour over the many years. I'm not sure it's been 34 no. last year, but you know, it's, it's ongoing. It's ongoing. So uh, Dr. Childress will facilitate questions at the end, and after that I hope many of you will stay for a reception in the lobby upstairs, which always means food in the School of Nursing. <laughs> so the Vice Lectureship takes its name from a woman, a very special woman who was much beloved in the School of Nursing. She led the school during an important time in our history. Zula Mae Baber Weiss was a thoughtful, warm, and accomplished woman. She received her diploma from the School of Nursing and later served it with distinction as a nurse, a nursing supervisor, educator, and administrator. She was remembered and admired for her intelligence, vision, and integrity, and also for running through the tunnels with Professor Weiss here, who was a famous, famous um, 
uh, professor here for many, many years. She was a key player in developing the School of Nursing into one of the 11 autonomous schools here at the university. So as you read in today's program, our lecturer is also a very accomplished and admired educator and a friend of many of our professors in the School of Nursing for years and years, and her dean as well. Julie Thurman is a professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. She holds a secondary appointment in the Department of History, the History and Sociology of Science, and is a member of the Women's Studies Faculty Advisory Board. She currently serves as the director of the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of the History in Nursing, and this is one of two major history centers in the United States. And guess where the other one is? <laughs> University of Virginia. Um, run by Dr. Professor Arlene Keeling here. So her research on the history of nursing and healthcare has yielded a continuous stream of funding and has earned her accolades from the American Association on the History of Nursing. In fact, one of her first books was the history of my specialty, critical care nursing, which was a bestseller and a winner, I believe. So last year, Dr. Fairman, as you heard from um, Marcia Childress, was at the Institute of Medicine. She was their Distinguished Nurse Scholar in Residence, where she worked with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on this wonderful initiative on the future of nursing. And in July, she was elected to the Sigma Theta Tau International Hall of Fame. And I just learned that this week she will be honored at the University of Pennsylvania for her selection as an endowed professor in the aptly named Nightingale Chair. This is truly wonderful. So we are thrilled to have her with us today. You know, you never know where a story in, in nursing is going to turn up. So she will share a little bit about that with us. And she also mentioned to me once that when they had, when she was invited um, to interview to be on the uh, senior staff, by the senior staff of the IOM, they had asked her, what could she offer? What could a nurse historian offer about the future of nursing? And in an editorial in the history review, um, journal. She had said, I will offer perspective and context. And I think we'll be doing some of that today. So please join me in a warm welcome for our colleague from Penn, Dr. Julie Fairman. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Well, I would like to thank everybody for this great honor to uh, be able to talk with you today. Um, I've always had a really big place in my heart for this university um, and my long-term co colleagues at the School of Nursing, especially Dean Dory Fontaine, and my colleagues at the Center for Historical Inquiry in Nursing, Dr. Barbara Brody, Arlene Keeling, and Mary Gibson. And I'm really very happy to be back here. I love coming back here. <coughs> I am a nurse, and I am a historian. Historian John Gaddis talks about history, <coughs> analyzing the past to understand the present, to shape the future. And that is what I have tried to do in my work, though probably not as seamless as John Gaddis, who is a very famous historian, has done. My trek from the history of nursing to the future of nursing actually began about 10 years ago, actually 15 years ago when I published my first book on the history of critical care. In that work, I began to see how practice informed education, instead of the other way around, and how practice and education together shaped the systems we have in place to provide health care to our citizens. And that, in particular, was the subject of my next book, which was on the history of the nurse practitioner movement. Now, since then, I've begun to look more broadly in terms of how the health care the public wants and needs meshes with the policy decisions at the national level, and how policy itself is formulated and reflects the context of clinical practice on the ground. So what I'm doing now is looking at the reconceptualization of primary care from 1950 to 1990, and looking at all the interesting and innovative models that start creeping up in that time period in terms of how we can provide health care at particular times and places to particular groups of, of people. And we will see, in fact, how those models shaped, or perhaps didn't shape, <coughs> national policy. Now we all know, and I don't have to tell you, that the health care system is fragmented in that uh, we are much focused on acuity, when in fact the great need for health services for the public 
rests in chronic care management, health promotion, disease prevention, community-based care, and public health. Although we're always really glad to have that acute care needs reside outside of an acute care focus. Now, the background, Marcia gave a little bit about the background of the Future of Nursing Commission. Um, it started in 2008, a consensus project between Robert Wood Johnson and the Institute of Medicine, resulting in a blueprint for strategy for moving patient care forward. This, it's really critical to understand this report, although it used nursing and thought about nursing, was really about transforming patient care. It was released in 2010 on October 5th. It immediately crashed the IOM server, which I thought was kind of ironic. A nursing report crashing an Institute of Medicine server. <laughs> amazing, amazing attention. So we have the report. The next thing was on no November 1st. It was a major consensus conference that brought together stakeholders, both nursing and non-nursing, to look at the blueprint and develop strategies for moving the recommendations forward. The next step in the process has been the campaign. Some of you may have seen some of the literature from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but that foundation paired with AARP, the biggest consumer group in the country, to develop strategies for moving this report forward. And it has involved media, it has involved all kinds of resources to the states in terms of education, health policy, that is really different than any other I-1 report we have seen in recent history. This report has legs and it is moving forward. It was chaired by Donna Shalala, the former Health and Human Services Secretary under the Clinton administration, and co-chaired by Linda Burns Bolton, who's the CNO at Cedars Lebanon Hospital in Los Angeles. Two very, very powerful and important people. 16 members on this commission, only four were nurses. This was important because it really increased the legitimacy of the report. There were four physicians. The rest were public figures, health policy people, and health management people. Now, let me just say, what, it, as when, you, when you work with the IOM, what you find is that you can only talk about things that have evidence associated with them. So this is a little caveat. What's in this report is evidence-based. What's not in the report, we didn't have enough evidence to put in the report. So there are going to be some things people always ask me about what's missing, what's not, and why isn't this here, but that's just my little disclaimer. So this is the main message of the I-1 report. High quality patient-centered health care requires remodeling aspects of the health care system, in particular nursing. So since this release about a year ago, a lot of things have to, has happened. What I'll do is review the report briefly and then go into what's going on. But <laughs> since the launch, there have been, it, it is, by the way, the most popular website on the IOM webpage. It is the first with the highest hits, just to give you an idea. And as of June 2011, there were over 24,000 downloads of the report, free downloads of the report. You can all go there. I believe there's a little um, page out here with resources on it, go to that website, you can download it by, for free. There were 62 million media impressions on this report. So you can tell people are talking about it, some positive, some negative, all kinds of things, but we are, at least are getting attention. There have been groups in every state that have coalesced to form partnerships to move these strategies forward. And even the Health and Human Services Secretary, Kathleen Sebelius, mentioned and talked about this report in an interview in the 2011 January New England Journal of Medicine um, issue, the same issue in which there was a scope of practice piece in the perspective section in which I was first author. So this is getting a lot of attention. There are four key messages. The first one was that nurses should be able to practice to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills. And this goes for nurses across all levels from generalist nurses to advanced practice nurses. And another caveat, one of my research is on nurse practitioners. I really do mean advanced practice nurses, but sometimes I go back and forth between the, the lingo there. Now, I think scope of practice is really important for every healthcare provider, from physicians to public health case workers, in terms of how all health professionals can work together and practice together 
to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills to provide health care that the public needs. And there are two reasons for this, at least. The one is that in view of the shortage of the primary care providers in this country, and in 2015, an additional 32 million customers moving into the health care system, we are going to need all hands on deck. We know we don't have enough primary care providers plus PAs plus advanced practice nurses to meet the needs now. We won't have enough in the future. The second is that we, have, we invest an enormous amount of money in the education, public money and private money, in the education of health professionals across the board. And unless they practice in an environment where their skills and knowledge are maximized, our investment is not optimized. And this is particularly true in public health, primary care, chronic illness management, and end-of-life care. Now, what you have in front of you is a map on the Center for Championing Nursing in America website. The fuchsia states are those that have adopted the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Model APRN Act. The dark blue are the ones where collaborative agreements are required to prescribe. So fuchsia is no collaborative <coughs> agreements needed for prescription treatment or diagnosis. Dark blue, uh, light blue is collaborative agreements to prescribe. And dark blue are states where collaborative agreements are required to prescribe, treat, and diagnose. So what you can see is that there is enormous variation <coughs> across the states in terms of scope of practice regulations, including in some states stringent requirements for prescribing privileges, oversight, and chart reviews, and the maximum collaboration ratios. In some states, nurses can't verify home health care services, skilled nursing home placement, or placement in hospice. They can't order durable equipment. They can't admit to hospitals without physician supervision or physician collaboration. It varies across the states. Additionally, credentialing and payment are linked to state regulations. More restrictive states are less likely to certify and to um, credential nurse practitioners as primary care providers. This has incredible implications for Medicare, Medicaid, state children health insurance programs, and for private insurers in terms of access and payment. Place matters, by the way. Historians always look at place. Place matters. <coughs> and the South seems to be a particularly restrictive place for scope of practice barriers. For example, take New Mexico and Texas. New Mexico has independent practice for advanced practice nurses. Texas, on the other hand, requires very detailed and sometimes onerous practice collaboration agreements, not only for practice in general, but in order for those nurses to prescribe. If a nurse works in an underserved area, she must contact the collaborative, collaborating physician every day and every month 10% of their charts are reviewed. But we can also see this case with Virginia, Maryland, and the district where Maryland has independent regulations, and Virginia, and the district does too, and Virginia does not. Now, these barriers are, there is, there's very little evidence for the barriers in general. And um, the variance really does not appear to be related on any performance measure of quality and safety. It seems to be related to the strength of the State Nursing Association, the strength of the state medical association, and the strength of public satisfaction and public organizations. This is why the AARP organization involvement in the future of nursing is so critical. Now, another issue with the scope of practice is that the scalability and sustainability of innovations in models of patient care are influenced by scope of practice. Um, barriers and laws. For example, the success of new models of delivery of care, such as the medical home and the accountable care organizations, depend exclusively, not exclusively, but depend very much on the ability of nurses and physicians and other health professionals to work together and to practice to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills. They have to collaborate, they have to work together, from health promotion to illness management. 
We see the results of such models in places and states that do have some more liberal practice legislation, and we see it in the VA system. Interesting because scope of practice depends upon the system rather than the place of practice. So these practice, uh, scope of practice regulations in the VA system are more liberal than most of the states in our country. Geisinger Health System and Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente are two other examples. In state health reform in Massachusetts, for example, after reform legislation uh, was implemented, they began to notice increased waits for primary care providers and increased visits to emergency rooms. In that state, they did not have enough primary care providers and APRNs were not defined as primary care providers by the state. One insurance company claimed that it would not include NPs on their provider panels unless the state required them to do so, despite the fact that they did so in New Hampshire and in Maine. The RAND study, the RAND Health Foundation study Massachusetts after health care implementation, after health reform implementation, and it showed that using nurse practitioners and PAs to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills would save the state $4.2 billion to $8.4 billion over 10 years. Retail clinics were the same issue. Many clinics were first blocked from opening in Virginia. In Virginia, I'm in Virginia. We're talking about Massachusetts here. <laughs> I wish I was 34, by the way. <laughs> And so the Rand Corporation studied retail clinics on behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And they found that greater use of retail clinics, which are primarily staffed by nurse practitioners and sometimes PAs and pharmacists and physicians, could save the state an additional $6 billion over 10 years. So increasing, the scope, not increasing, but expanding the scope of practice and practicing to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills allows the states to provide high quality and perhaps cheaper um, health care. Transitional care is another model that is influenced in its sustainability and scalability by scope of practice laws. The Coalition for Evidence-Based Practice noted that this is a top tier example of, of an evidence-based innovation. So Mary Naylor and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania developed this model to help elders transfer from the home, from the hospital to the home and to stay in their homes. Evidence has showed that nurse lead teams can affect a 30 to 50 percent reduction in hospitalization and save, according to their data, each patient will be able to save $4,000 per patient within a 5 to 12 month um, after discharge. However, restricted scope of practice laws limit what the nurse practitioners can do in those homes in terms of providing primary care and responding to acute episodes. Um, extra visits that they can't prescribe and times would be lost trying to get permission to act. The nurse family partnership model is also seen as a top tier example. This is a home visitation program for the first time mothers who are mostly unwed and emotionally low income, and in places where nurses can practice to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills, they've been able to see a 20 to 50 percent reduction in child abuse and neglect, and a 10 to 20 percent reduction in subsequent births in late teens and early 20s. In nurse managed health centers, we see the same thing. 250 of them in the United States in general, with a service group of 1.5 million people, mostly uninsured and mostly underserved. Evidence from these centers show that clients make 15% fewer ER visits and at least 35 to 40% fewer non-maternity hospital days from these nurse-managed health centers. Now, the Affordable Care Act has authorized $50 million for these centers, and I believe that money was just allocated. Um, the problem here is that the federal government is increasingly turning to, private, to the private sector to manage Medicare, Medicaid, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. And insurance companies are reluctant and do decline to include nurse practitioners on their provider panels or as primary care providers. And the federal government has refused to mandate that they do so. <coughs> now, the reasoning behind this particular recommendation is that um, to improve access and quality of care to all of our citizens with these 32 new million people coming in to the system, we need everybody. 
the double AMC has predicted that between now and 2015, we are going to quadruple the shortage of physicians. It's about 64,000 physicians that we will be short by 2015. This also includes a substantive number of also specialist shortages, about 33,000 specialists, including cardiac, cardiology, oncology, and emergency medicine. And to make this situation worse, nearly one third of all physicians are expected to retire in the next decade. And so the ability to ramp up the workforce for what's ahead of us will be very, very difficult. Virginia and its physicians are similarly aging, and about a third of Virginia physicians are now 55 or older. So the amount who will be retiring in the next 10 years is quite large. Now, um, John the map. Thank you. I won't spend too much time with this, but in fact, I won't spend any time because I, I don't think I can bring it up. But um, this is something from the Robert Grant Center, and it's called the Doc Map. And what this is is an interactive map. So this is a really interesting resource if you want to look at provider population ratio. And what happens is you can put your cursor, and we can go back to the slides, John. That's OK. Um, you put your cursor on different counties within the um, within the state and you'll see the physician patient ratio and you'll see where the shortages are. And you'll know where the shortages is, but this documents it in clear detail. And we do know that Virginia really does have a primary care shortages shortage uh, in 80 locations. At this point now Virginia needs 149 more physicians in 23 and including 23 psychiatrists to eliminate these health provider shortage areas now. In the future it will be even, even greater. So what was the key accomplishment from this recommendation? Well, interesting enough, Donna Shalala really hooked on to this one as sort of her, her main, this is the thing she was really interested in. And she has talked to the Federal Trade Commission. And what, what we've seen so far is that key congressional members, including the chair and the senior Democrat on the Senate Commerce Committee, has written to the Federal Trade Commission based on the IOM recommendations and urged the Commission to review proposed and existing state practice acts for restraint of trade issues. And I know within the last year and a half, at least three states have received letters of inquiry from the Federal Trade Commission. So basically what this, record, this one particular focus key area says is expanding the scope of practice is critical for transforming the healthcare system Transforming patient care is important for all providers to be able to practice to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills. Now the next focus was education. If nurses are to be as effective as possible in helping to transform health care, they'll need to be better prepared to take care of the compl increasing complexity of patients and as patients move into the community. This is the 80% of baccalaureate preparation by 2020 and the doubling of the doctor doctorate in nursing. So there's six, at least six specific things. You have to remember, we have eight recommendations and 42 sub-bullets, so it's pretty extensive. This report is about 500 pages. And besides, uh, if you don't read it, at least use it for a, desk, uh, a doorstop here. But it's a big thing. Um, so one of the first specific things was to uh, recommend that uh, colleges define academic pathways beyond articulation and that the Commission on the Collegiate Nursing Education monitor this, so define academic pathways. Second is that associate and diploma degree students should enter baccalaureate programs within five years of graduation in order to increase the pipeline and move this recommendation forward. Third is that um, the diversity of the workforce desperately needs to be improved. Number four. Collaboration with other health professionals is key in terms of education and practice. And this is where we're seeing, actually, a lot of the action in the state wraps, and I'll tell you a little bit about that um, later. And I know that Virginia here has funding from the Macy Foundation to look at collaborative uh, initiatives, and I believe you were just telling me about um, this wonderful end-of-life program with Harvard Macy that um, has been in effect. Um, so you, this is the future, and this is where we're going. <coughs> Doubling the number of doctorates is key because we have severe nursing faculty shortage 
And the only way to get people into um, faculty positions is to move them path faster through the education pipeline. Um, ensuring that 10% of all baccalaureate graduates enter a upper level graduate program within five years of their graduation. And six is nurse residencies, sort of to ease the transition to practice across all levels. And if you change from one place to the next, if you go from public health to ICU and reverse. So lots going on here. So why the 80 by 2020? Where did we get that? Well, there is some evidence, and um, there's a lot of rationale. And first of all, the baccalaureate programs <coughs> emphasize liberal arts, advanced sciences, and advanced nursing curriculum across a wider range of settings than the associate degree programs do. They expose st students to leadership, communications, and community and public health. And this is crucial as we begin to move more patient care into the community. And number two, we need more faculty. The evidence here is that there are studies that support the association between education level and patient outcome, particularly in acute care settings. The other piece is that traditionally, only about 6% of associate degree graduates go on to higher levels of education, only 6%. There's no way we can get the faculty and the researchers and the scientists that we need to move the science forward if only 6% move on to a baccalaureate program. 20% of baccalaureate nurses move on to graduate programs. Hence the idea of moving baccalaureate graduates faster through the pipeline. <coughs> Doctoral education is, is also <coughs> important. What we've seen from the National League for Nursing data is that nursing faculty are less well credentialed than their counterparts in other academic disciplines. Only a third of nurse educators hold doctorates compared to 60% of all post-secondary faculty. The rate of doctoral preparation among nurse faculty and baccalaureate programs is only two-thirds of that of faculty overall. And in associate degrees only programs, only one in 10 faculty have a doctorate degree. The only type of institution that even comes close to the rest of the university credentialing is in Carnegie One research intensive institutions like this one. And as the need for nursing education and research and for nurses to engage in team-based practice and research grows, the numbers of nurses with PhDs has not kept pace. And the main reasons for this lag are an inadequate pool of nurses with graduate degrees, faculty salaries and benefits that are not comparable to those in the clinical arena, and a culture that, and this is kind of controversy, but a culture that promotes obtaining clinical experience prior to going on for graduate education. There's a feeling that team-based research and practice in many ways tempers this need, and one of the areas to be fostered in graduate programs across disciplines is collaborative and integrated research. And again, to put fuel to the fire, the 2005 National Research Council report on nursing research identified important barriers to the future of the field. An aging cadre of nursing scientists, longer times required to complete the doctorate, and increasing demands on nursing faculty to also meet workforce demands. These are the barriers. So where are we now? We know that 50% of nurses have a baccalaureate degree, although I have to tell you the data is really difficult to interpret because they keep changing terms. So, but this is, this is what we've got so far. 13% of nurses hold a graduate degree and only 1%, actually less than 1%, have a doctoral degree in nursing or nursing related field. We know that over the last 10 years, we have not been able to graduate more than 500 to 600 PhDs. This is a trend, and this has to improve. Now, Virginia, this was kind of hard to pull out because, again, the definition, the data definition, and the way they define are they nurses in active practice, nurses not in active practice, which nurses are they talking about? But you can speculate that about 55% of Virginia nurses hold a baccalaureate degree, and this is higher than the national average. We can also see that nurses in Virginia have some sort of educational mobility. Again, I'm not sure which nurses that we're talking about here, but
But we know that, for example, LPNs and associate degree nurses, 10% are moving on to additional education, again, greater than the national average. And that 40% of nurses are moving to higher education, which I think is much, much better than the national average and really something to be commended, but still a lot of work to do. The nursing uh, group is also aging in about Greater than 50% of nurses, Virginia nurses, are over the age of 55, um, with the national average around 60%. So you can see where the need is in terms of getting people into educational programs. So what's happening uh, with the regional <coughs> action coalitions? These are groups that have partnered with non-nursing stakeholders to move the recommendations forward in each state. So for example, inter education has been one of the most frequently focused on recommendation. They, each of these RACs, the Regional Action Commissions, coalitions target one of the recommendations, and education, about 80% of them are targeting education. And where we see a lot of the target is an interdisciplinary education, particularly through st simulation. Uh, for example, there's a great program at Texas Women's University and Baylor Medical College where the students from both schools trained together in the simulation lab from low fidelity to high fidelity. We're seeing this in Indiana and in Connecticut. In Florida, they're developing a, a novel nurse to be an education model, and their commission on higher education is beginning to allow community colleges to bestow baccalaureate degrees. Uh, in Georgia, doctoral granting institutions are providing PhD programs online and DMP programs in remote settings. New Mexico, one of the more innovative things that's, that's going on is that they are developing a uniform nursing curriculum. So instead of 24 separate curriculums across their state system and across their schools, they will have one major curriculum. They'll be able to pull faculty and help address the faculty shortage. California is also developing a transition to practice program that is built into the tuition model rather than having the institutions where the nurses work pay for the transition care model. Uh, the fastest growing programs we're seeing in terms of education innovations are BSN to PhD. We're also seeing associate degree to master's and something that we've been talking about in terms of associate degree to PhD programs. There are a lot of second degree people in associate degree nursing programs these days and this is the group that can be fast tracked into the PhD programs. <coughs> The next key issue was leadership and the understanding that nurses bring important perspectives and voice and point of view to management and health policy decisions. And we need to prepare more nurses to help lead in improvements in health care, quality, safety, access, and value. This has to do with the kinds of knowledge and skills that students are learning in their programs. As leaders, nurses must act as full partners be accountable, work collaboratively, and serve actively. Do not wait to be asked in terms of act, acting as a leader or moving into leadership positions. And I'll just relate a little vignette. I've stolen from Donna Shalala, which also is important to remember. She said she was talking, there was her, one of her coaches was talking to a new recruit, and he said to him, when you catch your first touchdown pass, do not dance, do not put on a big exhibit, he said. Act like you've been there before. And that is very true, and that is very key for nurses. Act like you've been there before and don't wait to be asked in terms of leadership. Now, what are some of the things that are happening in terms of leadership recommendations? Well, not only do we have nurses at, nurses at HRSA, in MedPAC, and in Congress, and on the new Workforce Commission, Peter Beerhouse is the chair of that, but we don't have any money appropriated for that yet. But there are nurses there in leadership positions. Uh, you can see that some nurse leaders are requiring all nurses to have BSN degrees, attain a BSN within 10 years, and a new residency program. And additionally, the LeapFrog Group has announced in July that it will report on a hospital's magnet status in its 2011 report. This is really important because this survey is the gold standard for comparing hospitals' records on safety, on performance, and safety and quality. And the inclusion of magnet status in this survey really recognizes, I believe, the leadership role that nurses play in quality and safety initiatives 
and in transparency. <coughs> the last one is data. Um, you know, as I said, we were trying to pull this together to figure out how many nurses do we have, what do we need, it's all over the place. And so what we need is some sort of central place to collect data across the states. So what is happening, and this sounds sort of mundane, but it's incredibly important, is that the National Council of State Boards of Nursing and the Forum on State Nursing Workforce Commissions have agreed to jointly collect nursing workforce data from the states in 2012. Again, a seemingly sort of boring kind of thing, but this will give us an incredible work data, database in order to better predict how many nurses we need, what kind of nurses do we need, and hopefully this will help us move forward. Now, the Campaign for Action, again, this, this really was extraordinary. It probably took the foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who does a, a lot of things with the nursing profession, to really instill this idea of a campaign with, this, with these recommendations, with this IOM report. There is media associated with this. This campaign has been branded. It has really kept, been kept in the public eye a year since it's been um, put into place. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think this report really has legs. There have been a lot of reports on nursing in the past, including the 1983 report, which is the last time the IOM studied nursing on a broad scale. There have been other pieces to it, but this is really what we've seen. Um, so it, we've got these campaigns. And so this is what the map looks like in terms of those who were involved in this campaign. There are only a few states that are not, like Alaska, for example, New Hampshire, Alabama, and South Dakota. Virginia is, has an action coalition, which some of you may be surprised to know, but there is a Virginia action coalition, um, which has brought together the Virginia Health Reform Advisory Council, the Virginia, um, uh, let's see, AARP in Virginia, the Virginia Nurses Association, and what they're working on um, is developing a seamless educational pathway to help nurses achieve higher levels of education and training. They do have a website, I believe. <coughs> if you're interested, go take a look at it. Now, there are other accomplishments um, with other multiple partners, and many national organizations <coughs> publicly supported the report and the recommendations in very meaningful ways. And this includes Aetna, the American Red Cross, the Healthcare Information and Management System, the National Hispanic Medical Association, um, the National Medical Association, and the World Health Organization. And some of the sort of examples of the programs that are going on is that, for example, the AAC and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing has launched a collaboration with the German Center for Nursing Excellence. They've put $2.5 million to increasing the number of students in a PhD program, 150 doctoral programs from across 50 states. And Target, where a lot of these retail clinics are based, has promised to engage as clinical nurses in leadership positions and other kinds of opportunities. So to sort of bring this all together, you know, where are we and what does it mean? Well, we really are poised, I think, and we have a, trans to, a chance to transform the healthcare system and the culture of healthcare, but it only can occur if all the health professionals work together in practice and education to lead and to practice to the fullest extent of their knowledge and skills. We are on the cusp of being able to do wide-ranging improvements in the healthcare system and directly improve patient care. But it will take all of us to get there and all of us working together for the sake of the patient. So what can we do besides what's already being done? For nurse, nurse educators, teach the report. Make sure your students know about it and at least read the executive summaries and the four brochures <coughs> that are on the IOM website um, on the key points. Students need to see the future and the need and the possibilities of innovation. And while the report demands a great deal from institutions that already are economically and resource strapped and working in capacity, we cannot lose sight of the incredible opportunity before us. This report was done at a 
amazing opportune time. Health reform was being debated in Congress. We had a direct line to Congress. And, and perhaps this is somewhat almost more important, is that most of the major, the, nurse, the major nursing organizations are united on this in terms of pushing this report forward. That sort of solidarity we have not seen in nursing in a long time. <coughs> now is the time. We all need to be ready and prepared with the skills, the knowledge, and the experience to improve patient care for all. It's time for innovative programs. It's time to look for new places for funding. It's time to do better with the resources we have at hand and rethink traditional educational models. We have to believe that students deserve the best educators. And finally, we have to believe that patients need the best prepared practitioners across the board. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Julie Fairman. And if you want to stay right there, I will move through the audience and take questions and comments. And we have several minutes for some conversation. Um, let's see. I have Arlene Keeling from the Center for Nursing History here. Uh, Julie, I enjoyed your talk. And, um, as you mentioned, I was wondering, you know, in 1971, there's the Extending Scope of Practice report that was widely read, but um, not much happened. So you're thinking we're better positioned at this point to actually enact the report. Oh, we are so exquisitely positioned right now because of health reform, the shortage of primary care providers, and just a general sense within the nursing community that we really have to work together to move these things forward. There are a lot of contextual factors in place now that really make it an ideal situation for something happening. And one other question, is there an AMA official stance on the response to the report? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, there is. Um, and, um, you know, we were very clear during the progress of this committee that we would, we met at least twice with the major physician groups just to say, what are your concerns? What are you thinking about? This is what we're thinking about. So that the report would not come out and they would say, oh my God, what are you thinking? Um, the response from the AMA was pretty much the same response they give to just about everything that um, the only profession that, that can practice medicine is the medical profession. And that we welcome everybody into providing um, health care to the public, but they need to be pretty supervised. Um, Julie, I'm Pam Kalbach, a professor of public health nursing here at UVA. And I appreciated the sort of the scope and breadth that you provided to the discussion of this report. I have a concern, however, that what people hear is primary care. What people hear is uh, preparation to the level of scope and practice and training and nurse practitioners. And we know that within nursing, all the examples that you provided of transitional care, the uh, nurse family partnership, nursing managed clinics, all of those were built around public health and public health initiatives. And healthcare reform is all about prevention and wellness. And I think you mentioned that the number of patients that will be moving from the hospital to the community and to to sort of home-based public health care has the has the the committee addressed this in any way? I mean, I just see a lack of attention to advanced public health practice and including those other specialties as part of what preparation and, and practice to the level of your education. Yes, in fact, we did, the committee did pay attention to that. In, fact, in the report, there's at least one case study of the six or seven, I believe, that focuses exclusively on public health. And um, as, as, if you remember, one of the reasons moving through to baccalaureate preparation is because baccalaureate programs provide public health content and we'll be able to um, educate nurses to work across settings 
and to work in public and public health. So public health is incredibly, incredibly important. You know, the primary care shortage just really gets a lot of play right now because you know, people are having trouble entering the healthcare system as it is without those 32 million people. So um, that's, I think, one of the reasons to give us this high exposure. But public health is incredibly important to the Affordable Care Act as well as you know, just overall general health needs of the public. Talk loudly. No, uh, I won't go on the. Oh, so. you're not laughing. Hold on. No. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly O'Connell. I'm a fourth year, and I'm curious what your opinion is on returning to school right after graduation versus getting clinical experience, and how that applies to fast tracking to the master's and then PhD program. Mm -hmm. I would say that I think it's a wonderful thing to do, but it's not for everybody. Um, that there are some people who just need to spend some time in the clinical setting to decide what they want to do, where they see themselves. There are other people who are ready to take off on that research track. The research just enthralls them. They love the science. And they will then mesh that science with some clinical, clinical work. Um, you know, when we're working in research teams these days, it's not just researchers. There's clinicians working with researchers. So in order to, you know, have not having the, quote, clinical background that is our tradition, it's a hard thing for us to think about, by the way. This is hard for me to think about not, you know, not having clinical experience before going into some of these programs. But, you know, there is change out there. And as I said again, it's not for everybody. But the, the research teams, the clinical teams, you know, things are covered. And if you have the research skills to move the science forward to work with clinicians, that's also a very big issue, that, a thing that we need. Hi. My name is Karen Rose. I'm a faculty member in the School of Nursing and director of the undergraduate program. And we have many, many of our fourth year students in the audience today. And so part of what we talk about in our leadership course is the importance of being a clear communicator. And so my question to you is, can you give an example? What is the, your elevator talk or speech about the future of nursing? What should our nursing students be prepared to say? Oh, boy. That's <laughs> All right. In order to transform the health care, I mean, it would be the message, the, the initial message of the report. In order to transform, transform the health care system, we need to transform the way that all health professionals are educated and learn to work together to improve patient care. I mean, it's not a minute, but that says it all in that, in that statement. Other comments or questions? Julie, uh, great paper. Um, tell me if you think magnet status in hospitals have improved care and whether we would look for them as leaders for some of these innovations? Well, the, the evidence for magnet is above my pay grade, Barbara. Um, though I, I have, I know there is some, and we talked about it in the report, I can't give you the details of it in terms of patient outcomes. I do think there is evidence that shows that patient outcomes are improved, but I can't quote you who did it or where it is. Um, but in terms of leadership, that's where the magnet status issue hits the road. Um, because of the way that these um, institutions and these systems are governed in terms of more participatory governance and involving people across all the health professions in the governance of the system. So that's where the leadership piece. And, you know, we like to say that nurses are really um, the key people for understanding and analyzing and investigating quality and safety. And that's where nurses really do lead in some of these magnet hospitals and that's where I think is the, is the key the key issue. Other questions? Sure. Hi Julie. Um, I really appreciated your comments. I'm the co-chair of the Education Progression Committee for the Virginia Action Coalition. And um, it's a real a real pleasure to have all of these students here in the room. <laughs> Um, especially because we're trying to engage the student population as we go forward and talk about how we're going to support best practice in our state. So um, if any of you folks are interested, 
Um, I'm Linda Dito. You can find me in the global address book. <laughs> and um, we'd certainly be happy to have you work with us on this initiative. I think one of the most important things we can do is get the students involved and make sure that our ADN students understand where we're going and why we're going there. Well, and, and this is not, the report does not say that community colleges need to close their nursing programs. If you read the report, you know that it does not say that. In fact, there are, you know, we still have many pathways into nursing. The point is that once you get into a pathway, there needs to be better, sort of more seamless way to progress to higher education. So the community colleges are still incredibly important. Other questions? Hi, I'm Tori. I'm a fourth year student, and I have a question regarding diversity. I know you mentioned that during your presentation. So, what roles do you see, sort of, I guess, as undergraduate students, what role can we play in expanding like the diversity within the nursing community, and what role is being implemented to increase diversity for the future? Um, one of the things that um, that has been done with the, the RACs, the Regional Action Coalitions, and also from the leadership at the Center for Champion Nursing is to, to involve ECMA, which is the National Coalition for Ethnic Minority Nurses, um, which I'm sure you know about. Um, that is a conglomerate of different nursing organizations, and they're partnering. <coughs> and Tony Villarreal is, is part of that partnership with Center for, for Champion Nursing to put into place some better outreach um, initiatives. We know that the o some of the only ways we get people into nursing across any race and ethnic groups is if somebody knows somebody who's a nurse and who um, can serve as a role model for that person. And so, or, or has been sick, for example. People who are sick and have had nurses take care of them are converts. I mean, their attitude before and after is amazing. You know, so, um, what it has to do with is, public, in a sense, public outreach and finding those role models and, and getting people across the population into nursing. I'm afraid we're out of time, but it sounds like there's a lot of work to be done, um, not only by commissions and task forces and campaigns, but by individuals um, in the room and political institutions as well. Um, we will, in March, have um, Dr. Molly Cook uh, who headed the Carnegie uh, report on um, medical education reform. And so we'll be able, during the course of this year, to talk about sort of another profession's take on the future. And we can raise some questions. Come back then, all you nurses, and raise some questions about the, the cross-professional <coughs> training that's going on as well. Um, we'd invite you to come next week. We're bringing another speaker from the University of Pennsylvania. This is Anita Allen, uh, professor of law and professor of philosophy uh, and, uh, and on the Obama Bioethics Commission. Um, she'll be talking about the incredibly timely topic, medical confidentiality in the age of social media. Uh, so join us at the Hollingsworth Lecture in Ethics right here next week. Thank you very much. Thanks for your